All right, YouTube. Today, let's take a look at the physics of a Hohmann transfer. See, a Hohmann transfer is a way of taking an object in orbit, in this case around the Earth, and moving it from one circular orbit to another orbit. And a Hohmann transfer achieves this by firing a rocket just the right amount at two different points. The rocket does its first burn to kick the satellite out of its initial circular orbit into an elliptical orbit. Then later there's a second burn kicking that satellite back into a new circular orbit of different radius. Now if you understand the mechanics behind a circular orbit, then a Hohmann transfer is not too hard to wrap your head around. See, it's the basic concepts of what causes, or more importantly, disrupts circular orbits that we have to understand in order to understand a Hohmann transfer. So let's start our discussion of orbits right where Newton did, with a cannon atop a mountain. See, Newton postulated that a cannonball fired from the top of a mountain would be subject to two influences, the first being gravity, and the next being the inertia or the tendency of the cannonball to go in a straight line. And Newton realized that if the velocity of this cannonball was too slow, it would just fall to the ground. And if the cannonball was fired too fast, it would tend to shoot off into space. But if the cannonball could travel at just the right speed, it would orbit the Earth, always falling toward the Earth due to gravity but never actually landing. Now Newton realized the only force actually acting on this cannonball or any satellite is gravity. So we'll turn to Newton's second law to look at the math of what's going on here. See, for any object in orbit, the centripetal force is equal to the force by gravity. So expanding out each of these terms, we can set the centripetal force equal to the force by gravity. And you'll notice the mass of the satellite cancels out, as well as the radius of orbit sum. It still carries on here. Now I'm using the mass of the Earth because the Earth is the central object in this problem, uh, but realize you can apply a Hohmann transfer to orbits around any celestial body. Which leaves us with a function for the velocity of our satellite in both the initial and final circular orbits. Now, rather than doing this all in variables, I want to stick some numbers to this problem because there's a few really counterintuitive issues that come up when you actually look at the numbers and the outcomes of what happens in this Hohmann transfer. So let's start with the satellite, which is initially in low Earth orbit at this radius, and then transfer it further out to some greater radius. So applying this equation for the velocity in circular orbit to each of these orbits will get these two velocities. Realize these are the velocities that are required for the satellite to remain in stable circular orbit around the Earth. And these values can be a little bit counterintuitive because an orbit of a small radius actually requires a greater velocity to remain stable than an orbit of a larger radius. Now this is basic orbital mechanics, but to understand a Hohmann transfer, we need to go back up here to Newton's cannon and look at what happens when that cannonball is traveling too slow or too fast. See, if the cannonball is going too fast, it's gonna to tend to drift farther out into space. So if we can speed up our satellite right here, that delicate balance between gravity and the velocity of the satellite is gonna be disrupted and the satellite will drift off into space along this elliptical path called a transfer orbit. But the big question in a Hohmann transfer is, just how much do we have to speed up this satellite to get it into this transfer orbit? And if we do speed up this satellite, just how far is it gonna drift off into space? And the answer to that question is energy. See, the mechanical energy of an object is given by the sum of its kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. Now, anyone who's ever thrown a ball upward knows, as the ball goes up, it slows down. And that is to say, as the ball gains potential energy, it loses kinetic. 
And our satellite here is no different. As it moves farther away from the Earth, it is going to gain potential energy and lose kinetic energy. The key there being, exclusively under the influence of gravity, the mechanical energy of this satellite will not change. So if we can figure out the mechanical energy of this satellite at any point along this transfer orbit, we'll know the mechanical energy at all points along the transfer orbit. So looking first at the kinetic energy. We know kinetic energy is given by 1 half mv squared. Now for a circular orbit, we can substitute in this velocity which we already derived. So substituting this function in to our mechanical energy equation, then adding in the gravitational potential energy of an object in space. And if you want to see where this equation comes from, just click up here. I've got a video on exactly how to derive this gravitational potential energy function. Now combining these two terms we're left with, This equation, which tells us the total mechanical energy of a satellite in circular orbit. But remember, we're also looking at a transfer orbit, which is elliptical. Now this equation can be extended to an elliptical orbit simply by changing this value for the radius. Where a is not the radius of orbit, rather it's the length of the semi-major axis of the ellipse which the orbit follows. And there's something incredibly important to recognize here about the geometry of this ellipse as it relates back to the values which we've been given in this problem. And that is, if you look at the distance from where this burn 1 to burn 2 occurs, that's along the major axis of the ellipse. And if you were to add together the radii of the inner orbit to the outer orbit, You'll notice the total length of the major axis is simply equal to the sum of the two radii of the initial and final orbits. Which if we substitute into our equation for the energy of an elliptical orbit, we get this equation, which tells us the total mechanical energy of our satellite at any point along this transfer orbit. So now, using this equation, we can get back to the big question we were trying to answer, and that is just how much do we have to speed up a satellite right here in order to kick it into this transfer orbit? So what we're going to do is set this total mechanical energy equal to what's happening immediately after the engines have fired in this first burn. Now we know immediately after that first burn, the satellite's going to have some kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. Realize we can't apply this equation to our function now because we're no longer in circular orbit. This is going to be in an elliptical orbit. But the gravitational potential energy is still going to be given by this function we saw here. Negative g m e m over r. Now you'll notice the first thing to go away is the mass of the satellite. And rearranging this function, we get this function, which tells us the velocity of the satellite immediately after this first burn, while the satellite is still roughly at this radius, r1. And to show this velocity is different from the velocity just before the burn, I'm actually going to call this v1 prime, that is to say it's velocity after the burn. Now if you plug in these values for radii, as well as the mass of the Earth and gravitational constant, you'll find V1 prime, or the velocity immediately after the burn, in this case works out to be 9,053 meters per second. And going back to Newton's canon, that makes sense. If we speed up this satellite, it's going to be going too fast and it's going to drift off out into space. Now we can do a similar calculation to figure out exactly how fast the satellite's going to be traveling as it approaches this point here where burn 2 is going to occur. Except this time we're going to plug in R2 rather than R1. And it's in 
plugging in our values to this equation for the velocity of the satellite just before the second burn, that some of the really counterintuitive points of a Hohmann transfer show up. See, by plugging in the second radius here, we find the velocity of the satellite at this point, just before the second burn, is 4,526 meters per second. And that can be a bit counterintuitive. If we sped up the satellite to 9,000 meters per second here, why is it going so much slower up here? But realize, no different than when you throw a ball up in the air, as the satellite gained altitude, it lost speed. And the other counterintuitive point of this is that the satellite at this point right here is now going too slow. And again, going back to Newton's canon, if the satellite's going too slow, it's going to tend to fall right back down towards Earth. We don't want that. We want to keep this satellite in this nice, neat circular orbit. So that's going to involve speeding it up again in the second burn. Now, typically when working a Hellman transfer, you're going to be asked to solve for the two changes in velocity. Now, given the initial and final velocities from each burns, that's a pretty straightforward affair. We know a change in velocity is simply the final velocity minus an initial velocity. Now, when dealing with a specific rocket or satellite, once you have these two values, you can apply something called the rocket equation, which I derive up here to solve for the total mass of propellant which needs to be burned in order to achieve these two changes in velocity. But that's an issue for another day. So I hope you found this discussion of a Hohmann transfer helpful. And on that note, that's all for now.